Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 57th Emerging Growth Conference. I'm Anna Berry. I'll be your host today. Now, during each company's presentation, you can submit questions through the webcast module, and we will attempt to address as many of these as possible at the end of the presentation. Today, we'll be running until about 3.15 Eastern. Now, when we switch to the next company, you'll see a black screen for a moment. Don't go anywhere. That's just us moving over. If you do experience downtime for more than a minute or so, refresh your browser. Everything should work properly again. And our platform does work best on Google Chrome. So if you're watching from an Apple device, you have to hit the play button to start the session. Now, remember, all of our conferences, they're uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So please subscribe there, youtube.com slash Emerging Growth Conference. And one last note, after today's event, you'll be redirected to the registration page for our next conference. So stay on or come back to reserve your spot early. Let's begin today with Spire Global Inc. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol SPIR and is a global provider of space-based data, analytics, and space services, offering unique data sets and powerful insights about Earth so that organizations can make decisions with confidence in a rapidly changing world. Spire builds, owns, and operates a fully deployed satellite constellation that observes the Earth in real time using radio frequency technology. Today, we'll be speaking with Peter Plotzer, the CEO. Now, Peter is one of Spire's co-founders and serves as its chief executive officer. Prior to founding Spire, Peter worked on Wall Street as a senior portfolio manager and head of quantitative research. Peter has has degrees in physics and space science and management. Additionally, he earned his MBA from Harvard Business School. It's an honor to welcome you today on our conference. Peter, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Anna, to be at the 57th uh, Growth Conference. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. The floor is yours, and just call me back when you're ready for questions. Absolutely. So, uh, as, as Anna had said, Spire is a company focused on planet Earth, observing it from a fully deployed satellite constellation, about 100 satellites that scour the Earth 100 times a day, every 15 minutes, for information uh, as far and wide as the ships, planes, the weather, and much more to help humanity tackle some of our biggest challenges that we face. We are as mentioned, a publicly listed company. So we have this really sleep-inducing great statement um, that uh, we are required to show about potentially forward-looking statements from which I move on to the next slide to give you an overview of the companies that you have a sense. We are uh, over 400 people at Spire that serve uh, just about under 800 customers. Uh, with a target annually recurring revenue of 132 million this year. Uh, the company has a fully deployed constellation of 100 satellites, but more than that, it also has a fully deployed ground station networks, um, uh, 70 antennas in over uh, 30 countries. And we have uh, deployed that constellation by uh, over 35 launch campaigns over the last few years, giving us one of the most extensive experiences in space overall, our technology has a cumulative heritage of over 500 years, half a millennia that our technology has spent in space cumulatively collecting data to help humanity tackle its greatest challenges. Now, when you think about space and satellites in space, it seems often that there is a multitude of companies and they are hard to differentiate. Uh, in Earth, when you think about the transportation or logistics industry, it's a little bit easier because we have things that are called planes and we have things that are called ships and we have things that are called trucks. And even though they have a lot of things in common, they have you know wheels and they have captains and they have windows and they have cargo and they have passengers and they have engines. Um, it's very obvious when someone talks about a plane or a truck, how they are different. Now, from a use case and an actually inherent technology perspective, the same is true in space, but most people just call them satellites. So to help with that, um, there is a very uh, useful framework that is called talking, looking, and listening satellites. Now, talking satellites, sometimes called communication satellites, those are satellites 
that take data from one space on Earth and transport it to another location on Earth. Um, companies that you might have heard of are AST or Viasat or SES or Starlink or Kuiper, they fall into that category of talking satellites. Then there are looking satellites or uh, satellites that use imagery or cameras in some shape or form. And they take the reflection of the sunlight um, uh, from generally the land mass, the 25% or so of the Earth, which is, which is land mass, um, and then uh, capture the data. So it works really well during the day. Um, uh, as you can see right now, there's lots of summer, there's beautiful weather. It doesn't work quite as well during the night or when there is bad weather. And there are great companies there that I'm sure you have heard of, maybe a Maxar or a Black Sky, a Satellogic, a Planet, um, Airbus. Those are all companies that use the reflection of the sunlight to capture data. And then there are listening companies that use radio frequency technologies. Um, the advantage of uh, radio frequency technologies is, is that they can capture data during day and night because they're not dependent on the sun and in all weather conditions. As a matter of fact, with radio frequency technologies, you can actually capture information about the weather, like the speed of a hurricane or the wind speed in a hurricane or other kind of weather informations. Um, in that category, uh, Spire is the largest company by deployed satellite constellation customers revenue, um, but we're certainly not the only one. You know, GeoOptics, Hawkeye, Clears are a number of other companies in that listening category. So it's really helpful to have that framework in mind because there is actually just cooperation in certain limited instances in companies across those three categories. Um, uh, but not actually competition. There is just collaboration where certain customers want services from more than one category. You do, of course, have competition inside a, a category. Um, many of those categories are quite large as customers serve, uh, uh, have very, very different use cases. But it's important to understand that this categorization uh, allows you to understand which companies could be competing with each other and which companies potentially could be collaborating with each other. Now, Spire has a multi-purpose constellation, meaning that on the same deployed infrastructure, we collect multiple types of data. So our main markets being uh, maritime, aviation, weather, and space services, we track all of the world ships, which means all of the world's global supply chain, all of the world's global commodities, all of the world's uh, maritime traffic that relates to insurance or securities. All of that is tracked by our data, capturing over 500,000 ships every single day. The same thing we do um, for, um, uh, for aircraft in the aviation segment. Um, the fascinating thing for us was to learn that before the existence of Spire um, and other uh, fully deployed constellations, humanity actually didn't know where ships or planes were when they left land. Many of us still remember the tragic incident of Malaysia Airlines MH370, where we learned the hard truth that once an aircraft, in this case, leaves land, very soon no one really knows where it is easily without the deployment of a uh, fully deployed satellite constellation. And that was one of the core principles of Spire, namely to deploy a satellite constellation capturing data that is not available by any other means. Meaning what Spire does is not competing with any terrestrial means. It is though, in fact, answering questions that humanity has for a very, very long time, be that what is the weather going to be next week um, when planting season starts or, you know, ever since uh, someone, uh, Christopher, went on a big journey on a ship called the Santa Maria, the financier of that ship, the queen, asked where are my ships. So answering questions that we had for a long time, but without satellites, we can't answer them. The third element for us is weather. We track all of the world's weather. Weather impacts about a third of the global economy and about 100% of the world's people, I would, uh, I would like to say. And is, again, 
one of those uh, data types where because of the scarce population on vast parts of the earth, the data that drives weather forecast accuracy is a majority, over 80% derived from space. You need to observe uh, the weather from space to have any chance of, uh, of predicting the weather accurately. And what Spire has demonstrated is that massive untapped demand by our massive growth rate. Um, in 2017, we had a fully deployed constellation to capture um, for the first time all of the data across the globe. And that's when we had our first million of annually recurring revenue. And we've been able to grow that in five years to about 100 million. Um, and uh, if you take this year into consideration, that means over the last um, uh, six, seven years, a compound annual growth rate of over 100%. That really demonstrates you to you the massive untapped uh, demand that sits for these types of products, which in the end of the day is not particularly surprising given that the data that we produce is data that is only and exclusively available from space. And once customers um, enjoy the benefits of the products and services from Spire, they generally buy more from us. Uh, uh, the, the metric for um, uh, space as a, for uh, software as a service companies like Spire, net retention rate, which is a measure of how much com uh, companies on average, not just buy, but then buy more in the following year when they renew. And for us, it was 117% as of last year. And we had a very high net retention rate for all of this period, showcasing that customers have more use cases for the data and can take advantage of more and more of the product that Spire has once they have started to use our products. Now, how uh, best to think about our products is, is uh, uh, very simple. We have a fully deployed constellation that captures data once and then can sell it many, many times. And that is one of the key ingredients to the huge operational leverage and capital efficiency of Spire's business model is this collect once, sell many, many times. The data that we collect, we call it um, clean data, is like the first step in our subscription business. We should make it easy to use and available through an API as a subscription, and that is how customers then consume it. In the next stage, we then uh, add our analytics to it, and we also fuse third-party data sets to it to make the data more valuable to our customers. We call it our smart data product. Again, it's just a subscription, could be very easily upgraded by customers. In the next stage, we then take advantage of our ever-growing proprietary massive data uh, vault, where hundreds of millions of data points are flowing into that data vault every single day. And we train sophisticated analytics, AI, and machine learning models to derive what is going to happen, what will happen, prediction. And that is our next level of product, our prediction, a predictive analytics product. Again, available as a subscription. And then, of course, you have the last stage, which is now that you know what has happened in the past, what is happening right now, and what will happen, I'm giving you a, a, an, an intent of what you should be doing about it, our solutions that often involve analytics um, uh, and, and, and visualizations. So the power here is that the data is collected once from this fully deployed infrastructure and then can be sold many, many times. And then when you translate all of that business understanding from the company, serving trillion dollar markets like the maritime industry, the aviation industry, uh, logistics industry, agriculture, offshore wind farms, um, all the way to, to uh, formula one racing teams data to get an edge on, on race day. When you translate that into the financial metrics, you see not just a growing top line, but you see a massively improving bottom line that is getting ever, ever closer to becoming profitable, a target that we had set out um, over a year ago to be free cash for positive, by now it is 10 to 16 months, clicking down every single month on the timeline, which means um, before that we have to be and will be operating positive and before that adjusted EBITDA positive.
So this is kind of like the summary of the business model, the operational leverage, the, the large market, the large untapped demand, um, all of that uh, resulting in a business with a growing top line and very, very high margins, very quickly approaching profitability. And with that, I'll hand it over to Anna and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Great job, Peter. All right, let's... Um, first of all, talk about the defensibility of Spire's business or the moat around the business. Uh, so what are some of the barriers to other satellite-based Earth observation companies that have or are planning nano-satellite models deploying similar sensors on future launches and becoming a competitor to Spire? So there is a number of layers. There's about five layers that combined give us a, a, about a five, five and a half year head start. We think um, replicating the capabilities of Spire would take someone, even with quasi unlimited amount of money, about five, five and a half years. The first one is the underlying technology, the sensors. When we started out, um, some uh, people at NASA have said, Peter, you're gonna have to break the laws of physics to make that happen. Now, as a physicist trained at CERN, I can promise you I didn't break any laws of physics but it certainly was not easy and straightforward. So the first level is like those sensors we had to invent, we had to build them, and that is the first level. Um, uh, the next level is that you can't you know, really start competing with just a single satellite because the data that we collect requires a full constellation of satellites. So it's a constellation level of deployment that you have to have. The next layer then is our software, the analytics, where we have to um, uh, as assemble a team with often quite esoteric skill sets. You know, I'm talking Fortran, RF wave optics, um, uh, GNSSR. Those are pretty esoteric skill sets. That's not your, your run of the mill um, image recognition Python programmer. And we assembled those people, which is a time consuming process um, uh, even more so than a costly process to build the analytics that now serve our customers. The next layer is the data that I mentioned. We are collecting hundreds of millions of data points every single day that only we have because you require a satellite constellation to have that. With the data in our data vault, our AI machine learning and, uh, and advanced analytics models have a much, much richer data set. And as any AI company will tell you, the tricky part is accumulating enough training data so that you can develop powerful models to create value for your customers. Now that data that we have, you need a satellite constellation, no one else has it, we have it deployed and collecting it. The next layer is simply the logistics of deploying over a hundred satellites with multiple launches, a global ground station network. There is a logistics challenge of doing that which is the reason why not a whole lot of companies have been able to do so um, uh, at this point in time. And then there is the licensing component because you do require licenses to operate both those ground stations and those satellites. Some of those licenses take months, but some of those licenses can take years to acquire. Now you put again all of those layers, the hardware, the software, the analytics, the data, the logistics and the um, licensing to Together, we think before we even talk about our customer relationships in about five years to replicate where we are today. Well, speaking of, who exactly are your customers? And talk about the mix and how it's evolved over time between government and commercial customers. So Spire from day one had like the goal of having a balanced portfolio, about 50% government, 50% commercial. And because our global drivers are climate change and the impact it has on companies, countries, and communities, as well as global security, a lot of on the government side is civil agencies. So space agencies, uh, environmental agencies, um, uh, uh, NASA, NOAA, those type of agencies. But we do have some defense customers as well, um, especially when it comes to the global security aspect. And then the other roughly 50% of our business is commercial customers. Those are anything from shipping companies to maritime insurance companies to airports to predictive maintenance for aircraft to 
offshore wind farms to uh, agriculture companies to logistic companies to commodities companies to financial services companies that are consuming our data as a subscription. It has um, sometimes we have you know last year for example we had over 65 percent commercial of our business. You know, now in the first quarter, we are down to closer to 50-50. But overall, I would say, Anna, it's about half and half a commercial and government split internationally, about 40, 45% in the Americas, um, then a good portion in Europe. And so far, we still have a smaller portion in Asia, but we look at Asia as a very, very attractive growth market for us. Thank you for that. Uh, so one thing that sets Spire apart from your peers is the gross margins, which are actually pretty healthy. What, 57% gap or 62% non-gap in Q1? So, Peter, talk a little bit about what enables that and then what broader trends could affect gross margins going forward. Plus, what are you targeting for gross margins looking out around, what, two, three years? So Spire is at its core a very straightforward SaaS company. And with SaaS companies, you're used to margins in the you know, low 70s, if you take you know, an average. And that's exactly is the target for Spire. And what enabled that is that we have an ability to collect data in a proprietary fashion with a very small fixed amount of capital per year. Cost is about $10, $12 million to supply all of our space and ground infrastructure, replenish it, keep it, you know, working and operating. And then with that, we can, you know, collect the data once and sell it in quasi unlimited amount of time. So you have a small amount of investment that is reasonably fixed that gives you access to this proprietary massive data set that you then sell and quasi unlimited amount of time with the marginal sale just having a very small um, additional and extra cost from some AWS processing, but generally just flowing right through your gross margins to pay down the cost of that infrastructure. So just like other SaaS companies with a high recurring revenue, high net retention rate, and a collect once data set with a fixed fee that you can monetize an almost unlimited amount of time, we have very high gross margins. And can you also talk about the capital needs of the business? It's often something that tripped up some space companies, but it seems like your model would be pretty capital light. Is it? That is correct. You, you absolutely nailed it, Anna. As I said, for that constellation to collect the data, it's about $10, $12 million a, a year. That allows us to, uh, to collect the data once and then sell it across an unlimited amount of time. We have a fully deployed constellation. We don't need to grow it on the margin. Those satellites actually are getting massively better every single year. So on the margin, we can actually get away with maybe a, 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 a few fewer satellites over time. So um, the capital needs of the business are indeed reasonably light. Um, sometimes I spend more money on things related to the SEC and being a public company than, than deploying a satellite constellation. Well, we have a few questions um, continuing on from John Coco. He wants to know, what are the current technological challenges you're facing? You know, on the technology side, we feel actually quite um, secure. You know, one of the powerful things of Spire is like the software defined nature of our constellation which means that even after our assets have been deployed, we can upgrade them and change the type of data, the amount of data, the quality of the data that they can collect. And that allows us to um, tilt and change and adapt our business model and the type of products and services we offer to what we see in the marketplace. One recent example is uh, in the global security um, realm, uh, greater and greater interest for disruptions to, uh, to GPS, be that GPS jamming or spoofing that is disrupting uh, civilian aircraft in the, in, the, in the vicinity of airports, um, be that, of course, uh, more security-related things in the, uh, in the South China Sea or in the Ukraine. And through reprogramming of existing assets on orbit, Spire is able to provide the data and now um, owns and operates the largest commercial fleet of, it's called 
RF uh, detection and RF geolocation satellites um, on the planet. So this software-defined capability gives us a lot of flexibility. We just recently um, deployed and demonstrated optical inter-satellite links on small satellites. We believe we are the first ones to do so. We believe the first ones to have those type of laser satellite links on orbit in small spacecraft. And that is just our in-house capability that has grown out of our 500 plus years of space heritage. The team inside Spire has accumulated a lot of experience how to deploy capabilities around RF intelligence and RF data collection and RF sensing and RF technology in space over that time period. And so we feel pretty excited about the technology that we have deployed, that we have announced, and the technology that we have not yet announced. Wonderful. Uh, we have a follow-up question from John. You m mentioned this earlier, but talk more about how your sales are divided between government and private sector. So um, we have uh, generally a, a, a sales force that is focused on a particular solution. So like a sales force that is focused on the maritime solution, on the aviation solution, on the weather solution, and space services. Um, we do have force for the United States government. States government, we do have a dedicated sales force that is attached directly to the various customers offering all of our products, be that a GPS jamming or a, a maritime security domain awareness or a, um, a, a weather service. Um, international governments are generally served out of the solution sales force that are focused on, let's say, maritime. So. We have a maritime uh, a specific sales force that is talking to both commercial customers as well as international government. Well, Ethan Saxon says, congratulations on the New York Times article that uses your AIS data. And his question is, there is there a US government customer for your maritime tracking data? Yes. And, and I have to keep my answer to that question a little bit short, if he allows. <laughs> we understand. Uh, he also asks, when will you be able to repay your loans from Blue Torch Capital? Can you do so without further stock dilution? Um, we feel very confident with the balance sheet and the development of our cash flow margins to produce our own cash. And then uh, that cash can be used to multiple productive uses. You know, it could be used to uh, keep on growing the business if we think that has the highest return for the shareholders. It could be used to um, to buy back shares. It could be used to pay back that. Um, uh, there are multiple uses of that cash that we produce in 10 to 16 months is, uh, uh, is, is the timeline that we have set out to, to do, um, depending on, on what we and the board decide is in the best interest of all the stakeholders. And Brad Page wants you to clarify some of the the maritime custody service aspects, asking what is your revenue model on that? Is it recurring? Is it subscription? Are there other revenue types specifically for your maritime custody service? Virtually all of our products are recurring subscription businesses where you subscribe for an annual service that is paid genuinely quarterly in advance. And the maritime custody service falls under that very same category. Now, um, there are ways to customize the extent of the data service. So you don't have to get everything in the kitchen sink, like every single shame custody, you know, every single day. Um, you can get, for example, all ships that are under a particular flag or all ships that are of a particular size or from a particular to uh, craft that product for each and every customer. But all of it is uh, generally an annual subscription. Um, the only other offer that we have is historical data buys. So we do offer some customers to buy some historical data from us um, as it might um, help them in their business. Perfect. Uh, Carolyn Chef says the market appears to be very large based on your explanation. But her question is, what are top and bottom line expectations for the company this year and into next year? 
So for this year, our top line is uh, is indeed over 130 million of uh, annually recurring revenue um, with uh, uh, rapidly improving margins. I do admit that I don't know the exact percentages of our EBITDA operating margins um, uh, on top of my of my head, but we do announce them um, in our quarterly earnings calls, and we have given ever since we went public. Uh, both yearly guidance as well as quarterly guidance. And uh, if you if you wanted to reach out to investor relations at ben.hackman.spire.com, he can give you either an, a, a link to our presentation uh, from our last quarterly earnings call where we have the annual targets uh, specified, um, or you know you can also try to reach me directly, Peter at spire.com, uh, with those questions. Happy to provide them. But it's a steady march towards profitability as we tick down uh, our timeline to free cash flow profitability, which requires us to be operating margin uh, profitable before that. And then before that, you get EBITDA margin possible. So um, one simple way could be you take a ruler um, and you use the chart, um, which you might see on your screen, and you get a bit of a sense of where those three lines uh, get to over the next uh, a few, few, few months and quarters. Thank you for that. Question from Gloria. She wants to know how many satellites do you have and are you looking to add more? Great question, Gloria. We have about 100 satellites on orbit right now, um, and we, we do not expand uh, our, our constellation at this point in time. Uh, the technology is improving at a, uh, at a speed that is actually faster than Moore's Law and was the outcome of, uh, of my research piece at the, at the last uni university that I was at in France. Um, about tenfold improvement every five years is the track that small satellite technology has been improving. That's about 50% faster than Moore's Law was that was driving that computer revolution. So for us, um, 100 satellites capture the Earth about every 10, 15 minutes, um, about 100 times a day. That feels very good for us at this point in time. We have not seen customers asking for substantially more of that. So the satellite constellation, I think, at this point in time, can be expected to stay pretty constant for Spire. And Al Vaughn wants to know, is your data perishable? Once you capture data, what point does it become outdated or not valuable? It really depends on the data types. Also, like an excellent question. Some of the data has um, uh, less value uh, when it is historic. Now, in particular, um, some of our weather data has, has a lower shelf life. But for example, the movement of, uh, of oil ships, so the movement of grain ships, you know, um, there was the mention of the New York Times article earlier. Um, a good amount of the research for that article used actually historical data to figure out what was going on. Um, and then uh, we talked a lot, and the world has talked a lot about the advances in AI and machine learning that can extract ever more information from data and that means that historical data actually gets more and more valuable as those models require more and more data to come up with their um, algorithms to create valuable products. So it really depends on the data type, some of which are more perishable, some of which are a little bit more like a good old Bordeaux that get more valuable as they accumulate a little bit of age. Nice reference. Um, I'm going to try to combine some questions from Chris Gibbs and Derek Scott concerning customers. So how are you getting your customers? Talk a little bit about your sales model. Absolute great question, guys. Uh, it's a direct sales model. That means that our people are uh, holding everything from, from webinars and, and, and answering to inbound uh, requests to reaching out to customers and making them aware of the capabilities of Spire. Um, the single most often heard answer from customers we have is, wow, you can do that. <laughs> so it is an, an, an awareness uh, problem and not a what do I do with it problem. Um, and so they reach out and uh, because of the uniqueness of our data, um, uh, it's a very, very productive sales model. I think, I think the last time we published some numbers you know, we shared that um, sales reps have an attained quota per head of over $2 million. 
which is quite a bit higher than what you generally used to from SaaS companies. Because in SaaS companies, the barrier to entry and often consists a lot out of simple size. Now, the way you reach size is you have to spend a large amount of money often on sales and marketing, which is why many SaaS companies have a 50% of sales cost for sales um, and marketing, right? So a large portion of every dollar that they get from customers gets spent on more marketing and more sales, which is why it can be sometimes tricky for them to actually get to profitability, even at quite large a scale. Now, Spire's data is so unique and the barrier entry is so high that we can spend a substantially smaller amount on our sales and marketing expense. And that then of course means that our salespeople are that effective and attain those high quarters, which means they are extremely well paid. Um, uh, we plenty of years had salespeople make more money than myself and we absolutely love it that way um, uh, because the model works so well when you can bring to customers a unique data source that solves problems that they're very well aware of that they have. Well, you mentioned that your customers are uh, an even mix between government and commercial customers, but Derek wants to know what type of customers will you attract in the future that's not a current customer now? We have about 175 major use cases, Derek. Um, so there is plenty of customers that sit alongside those use cases that we have not done a land and expand strategy. The, um, uh, the, the underlying philosophy in Spire sales is called land and expand. Not that unique to some other uh, powerful SaaS business models as well. So think about, let's say, uh, ports. Um, uh, Port of Rotterdam is a big customer of Spire. Um, but there are... I think about 10,000 ports across the world, and they all have the same problems. Ships are loitering around their harbor, they're clogging up the berths, they burn a lot of fuel, it's a very um, uh, carbon dioxide um, polluting uh, activity, it's a very costly activity, it's a very frustrating activity. I mean, you, you, um, you fight the seven seas, you know, and, and then you land at the harbor and then you sit around there for like sometimes, you know, hours and hours and tens of hours burning fuel. And the more information the harbor has of like who is coming from where, when and why, um, the better they can run their operations. So once you have landed and really understood how do I communicate with a harbor? You can then replicate that from you know, the harbor of Rotterdam experience to tens of hundreds and thousands of others, um, uh, um, uh, other harbors. And that is the model that Spire generally works. So we go to those types of customers and then we replicate. We go to an um, a, a airport predictive maintenance company and then we predict it to all, you know, uh, uh, coverage all of them. We can go to an airline and then, you know, there's like, you know, a few thousand airlines and there's, you know, few, few, tens of thousands of business jet companies, right? We go to an, an A offshore wind farm and then we can go uh, to all of them. So it's this land and expand strategy that allows us to replicate the success we have in helping one particular customer help solve her problem and then replicate it to many, many other customers. Fascinating. Uh, Lance states you're currently trading at about five times sales. So what's your timeline for positive net earnings? So we have given a timeline for um, a free cash flow profitability. That's the, that's the one guideline that we have given which is um, uh, uh, 10 to 16 months from today. Um, I do want to correct um, uh, our sales last year was, uh, was in the 80 million range. You know, our sales for this year is, is in a 100 million range. So we are trading um, closer to one time um, uh, annually recurring revenue or trailing 12 month revenue uh, and not five times. But um, uh, from a profitability perspective, we have given guidelines on uh, free cash for profitability because that is like, you know, from our perspective, uh, the most important one to be in 10 to 16 months. Perfect. And Peter, if you could have investors walk away from listening to this conversation, understanding just one or two things about your business and its story, what would that be? I would say Spire is a, a 
classic SaaS company with massive barriers to entry, very, very high net retention rate and customer satisfaction rate um, that has a margin structure that allows us to get profitable very quickly and that is trading at a uh, historically uh, potentially very attractive uh, number. Um, of course, everyone has to make that assessment by themselves, but it's a SaaS company selling products, high net retention rate, very, very high growth rate. Wonderful. Well, we've really enjoyed this uh, conversation. Fascinating technology you have, and we look forward to having you back in the future. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Anna, and all the best for the rest of the day. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, everyone, stay with us. We will take a quick break, and then we'll come back at 10.50 Eastern. We'll see you soon.